Hi, my name is Ashley Nelson and we're here at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Today we're going to be covering brick calibers. I'm going to be covering the operation of the disc brake system, common failures of a brake caliper, and then how to diagnose those failures. The disc brake system came out in the early 20th century and since then it's actually been overtaking the drum brake system. This is because the disc brake system is easily accessible and all of the parts are ventilated so it can dissipate the heat faster and therefore have better braking power. If we go ahead and take this wheel off we can see all of the different parts of the brake, disc brake system and how they work together. Now that we've gone ahead and taken the wheel off we can see the entire disc brake system starting with the rotor. The rotor sits on the hub assembly and as you can imagine as the wheel spins the rotor will spin. In turn, as the rotor slows down, the wheel will slow down, ultimately stopping your vehicle. Here on this rotor's surface, gouges and scratches can actually occur because of uneven brake pad wear or problems with the piston or the slide pins. Moving on to the caliper, the caliper is really the heart of the disc brake system. Surrounding the caliper, we have a caliper mounting bracket here, which is mounted to the knuckle. We also have here a brake hose. This brake hose supplies hydraulic pressure from the ABS unit or the master cylinder. We also have here a bleeder valve with a boot covering it. And we also have two slide pins. We have one here and we have one down here. Along with two pistons on the caliper. If you can imagine, as you press your foot on the brake pedal, brake fluid will come down from this brake hose and build hydraulic pressure behind these two pistons. The pistons will move outward, pressing the inward pads against the rotor. This force will then be transferred to the outside pads and the outside pads will press against the rotor going in. This creates an even clamping force on both sides of the rotor. So now that we fully understand the different parts of the disc brake system, let's move over to the bench and actually see the caliper broken down. Brake calipers are really very easy to understand. Um, there are many different types of brake calipers depending on the application. Some might need one piston, some might need two pistons, some might actually need four pistons. So depending on the application, all these different calipers are going to vary, but they're all going to work the same. As you can see, there are many different types of calipers. Even though one caliper has one piston, the size of the piston may actually vary. For example, in comparison, this piston is a lot smaller than this piston. In turn, this piston is going to have a greater clamping force than this piston. This is something that you may find on a small sedan because it's pretty small, the brake pads are small. Something you might find on a maybe a bigger sedan in the front end. Um, moving along to some of these other calipers, some actually have an emergency brake built in to the caliper to apply hydraulic pressure when you apply your emergency brake. This one again has an emergency brake built in. The cable may clip into here and apply pressure to this spring, which will in turn apply hydraulic pressure and apply the emergency brake. As we mentioned earlier, some calipers can actually have two pistons. Now this caliper is something that you may find on a the front end of a large truck because the brake, pad, the brake pads are pretty huge um, along with the double piston. Lastly, we're going to be talking about a fixed caliper which is um, shown here. There are actually four pistons in this one caliper. So we're going to be going into more detail of that later. Here we have an example of a single piston caliper. We're going to go over the different parts of the caliper and how they work together. So first, as you can see, we have a housing for the piston along with a spot for the brake hose. The brake hose is actually still attached to this example. Um, this brake hose is going to apply hydraulic pressure behind the piston. We also have um, the bracket still attached, so the caliper mounting bracket is actually still um, attached to the caliper. The caliper itself is only this section here with the piston. If we go ahead and take this bolt out, we can open this up and actually see the slide pins. So this 
is the slide pin here. See how it can move in and out? That's exactly what you want. It can actually become seized and cause a lot of um, problems for the customer if they don't move freely. So th this example has slide pins, just as most will. Um, this is going to be considered a floating caliper. Floating calipers are by far the most common type of caliper as opposed to fixed calipers, which we're going to talk about next. Here we have an example of a fixed caliper. This fixed caliper means that there are no slide pins, as you can see here. It also means that there are pistons on both sides. As you can see, there are pistons here, and then there are also going to be pistons here. This also means that uh, as hydraulic pressure is pushed on these pistons, all four of them are going to move, pressing on the brake pads at the same time. This type of caliper isn't that common anymore. It is found on pretty fancy cars like Mercedes. Um, it's also found on racing applications. So although this type of caliper isn't that common anymore, um, it's still out there. These are going to be some examples of the different types of pistons that are found in calipers. Um, as you can see, they really vary in their different sizes depending on what the engineer decides is needed for the vehicle. Um, not only does the size vary, but the material actually varies. For example, this piston is made out of metal, while this piston is made out of plastic, which is called phenolic. Um, as you can also see, there are spots for the square cut O-ring, which is what we're going to talk about later. Um, pistons really, they can get damaged easily. I mean, as you can see, this piston was chipped. Maybe it was because it was plastic. Um, maybe it was because of you know, an application gone bad. So there are a lot of different aspects to the piston because it is really the most important part of the caliper. So now that we understand all the different parts of the caliper, let's see how they can fail. One of the most common parts to fail on a floating caliper are the slide pins. If we open up this caliper here, we can see the slide pin here. There is a dust boot covering the slide pin to prevent dust and debris getting in there. So if this slide pin were seized, you wouldn't be able to move it in or out, and you would actually, in some cases, need pliers to pull this out of its housing. In this case, the slide pin isn't seized, so you're able to move it in and out with just two fingers. It's pretty easy. And if you go ahead and take this boot off, you're able to see that it's very well lubricated. I recommend when you're doing a brake job, always make sure that these slide pins are well lubricated and move freely in and out. If one or both slide pins were seized, this would cause uneven brake pad wear along with brake drag. Another way that the caliper can fail is the piston. The piston rests in this housing. As you can see, there's this dust boot shield. The purpose of this shield, just like on the slide pin, is to prevent dust and debris from getting into the piston and causing problems. Another important part of the piston is the square cut o-ring seal. As you can see, the square cut o-ring seal sits here in this gap. The purpose of the seal is to help retract the piston when the brake pedal is released, so it's not riding and causing brake drag. This piston, it can fail in a couple of different ways. It can get seized inward, so it won't get pressed out anymore. This will cause the brake pads to never touch the rotor and never stop the wheel. This can cause a pulling sensation for the driver. This piston can also get seized outward and so it's always applying the brake causing brake drag and a pull for the driver. Okay so now that we finally learned how a caliper works and all the different parts that can fail on a caliper, now let's talk about some diagnostics. Okay, so today we're going to be using a 2010 Dodge Ram 1500 for the vehicle that we're going to be using to diagnose. The first thing that you want to do when you're diagnosing a vehicle with a brake problem is you want to figure out what is the problem wheel. Figure out if it, is it on the left side or the right side. Is the vehicle pulling to one side or the other? Um, a simple test that you can actually do if you've got brake drag is you can um, go for a drive. Hop in, get those brake pads, get that rotor hot, heated and pull over, or you know, when you get home from your drive, go ahead and put your hand in front of the assembly. See if you can feel any excessive heat, 
you know, the rotor should actually be cool a couple of minutes after driving. So if you go around to each wheel, and if one wheel seems extra hot, um, there's more temperature, if there, if there is brake drag, um, there's going to be excessive heat, and you're definitely going to notice a difference in temperature of that wheel and that rotor. Um, the next thing that you want to do is um, jack up the vehicle. You know, if you think your problem's in the front, go ahead and jack it up. We've jacked up this truck, um, and really just give the wheels a spin. Put it in park. You know, if you are working on a vehicle with front-wheel drive, maybe put it in neutral, and just give the wheel a spin. And you should be able to do it with, you know, a finger or two. You know, maybe even one finger. Just give it a light spin. It should be able to spin, no problem. You shouldn't really hear any drag coming from the assembly. Um, and really the next thing that you want to do is, you know, get someone in the driver's seat. Press on the brakes. When they press on the brakes, this wheel should not spin at all. Even with all your might, it should not spin. So if you even have a little bit of movement, your piston could be seized, not going out all the way, and you've got a problem. All right, so once you've figured out which wheel is your culprit, which wheel is actually causing you problems, the next thing that you can do is actually take the wheel off. So for example, say we've got a problem at the front passenger side wheel. Let's go ahead and take it off and see what we can find. Now that we have the wheel off and we're able to see in more detail um, the actual caliper and the rest of the disc brake system, you want to go ahead and do a more um, detailed visual inspection of the whole assembly. Again, look for more uneven wear on the surface of the rotor and go and take a full 360 look at the caliper. Make sure there's no um, brake fluid leaking anywhere, there's no crack in the housing. Make sure to look at this fitting. You could even have someone press on the brakes. Look to see if you see any weeping of brake fluid um, because, you know, the banjo fitting, um, the crush washers could be leaking. Um, also look at the bleeder valve and make sure you don't see any leaking anywhere. Um, if everything looks fine, what you want to do next is go ahead and take this caliper off. There's usually a couple of bolts holding the caliper on. Um, when you finally take the caliper off, as we mentioned earlier, we're going to want to look for uneven brake pad wear. We're going to want to make sure these slide pins move in and out freely. And we're going to want to look at the pistons. We're going to want to make sure that they're not seized and they're still able to get pushed back inward. Now that you've completed watching this video, hopefully you have a better understanding of how the disc brake system works, how a caliper can fail, and how to diagnose those failures. I'm Ashley Nelson, and thanks for watching.